Hi there, I'm your host, Mr. Doyle, and this is a great undertaking. In this video, I'm going to be discussing Stephen King's Dance Macabre, which was published in 1981. Prior to reading Dance Macabre, uh, what King's website describes as a nonfiction study of the horror genre, including books, movies, television, etc., I wasn't sure what angle I would come at this video from, but like many King books, once I dove headfirst into the text, there were some choice moments that led me in what could best be described as an unexpected direction. And while Dance Macabre didn't seem to be of particular interest to me, something I'll explain momentarily, the book provided me a pathway to a topic or two that I felt were worth exploring. Also, I want to mention that I listened to the audiobook version of Dance Macabre as I was unable to maintain enough focus and willpower to actually sit down and read it myself. Also, audiobooks are awesome, so all you anti-audiobook snobs can just bugger off. What I don't like about Dance Macabre. I love stories, specifically horror thriller fiction stories, and even more specifically, horror thriller fiction stories by Stephen King. I've yet to find one King novel that I didn't predominantly enjoy, even when they don't necessarily fall into the horror thriller genre. And I've read or listened to all of King's publications, many of them more than once. Anything Stephen King has ever published or had a hand in, really. Uh, Full-length novels, graphic novels, poems, screenplays, short stories, you name it, I've read it. Hell, I've even read the baseball books, which were, of course, less my speed. But as varied and unique from one another as they can be, I tend to enjoy all of King's written content in its various forms. That being said, there were two of King's books that I had put off and avoided reading, and both for the same reason. Um, those books are Dance Macabre and On Writing. I only just listened to Dance Macabre due to the fact that it was the topic of this video, so it was out of necessity rather than my own desire to read it that I forced myself to listen to the book. And don't get me wrong, Dance Macabre isn't entirely uninteresting or incessantly boring. I just happen to be a reader that is only attracted to a very narrow genre of literature. I'm not like proud of that or even happy about it, but for whatever reason, my taste in books is admittedly limited. The subject matter of Dance Macabre is of interest to me to an extent, but my brain working in the way that it does, for better or worse, had a hard time getting through it. Uh, Dance Macabre is essentially a history lesson and exploration of the genre of stories and films which I enjoy the most, in which King interjects and intersperses his own life experiences, personal stories, and fond memories of the author's books and films that he discusses. It's part textbook and part autobiography. In Dance Macabre, King discusses and on occasion gives play-by-plays of classic horror novels like Bram Stoker's Dracula, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, The Strange Case, Strange Case? The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, and several other time-honored horror standards. He talks about what he enjoys about them and why they have become the classics of the genre that they have. And he doesn't limit himself to authors or books, however, and he similarly discusses monster movies, creature features, and suspense films. King talks about the ways the books and films affected him personally and the impact they had not only on him, but on the genre and popular culture in general. King doesn't only cover the top-tier influencers of their respective mediums and eras, though. He's sure to include the low-budget, campy, laughable disasters, of which there were many as well. The parts of the book when King recalls an experience he had with one of the aforementioned works are enjoyable. It's when he gives summaries and, in some cases, 
reads directly from the books he is discussing or retells a movie scene by scene that my focus begins to wane. And unfortunately for me, these instances make up a sizable portion of the book. What I like about Dance Macabre. There were a handful of moments I found to be particularly interesting, uh, one of which had to do with Stanley Kubrick. In the book, King heaps praise on Kubrick, his films and cinematic style. He mentions A Clockwork Orange and 2001 A Space Odyssey and expresses his appreciation for the director's filmography. Now, I assumed this meant that Dance Macabre was written prior to Kubrick's film adaptation of The Shining, which, as I covered in my video for the film, King was very openly displeased with. Uh, but later in the book, he does mention the film adaptation and gets in a brief and fairly reserved dig. But it was so strange to hear him speaking highly of Kubrick considering all the negative feedback and stinging criticisms he had for both Kubrick and The Shining following the film's release. In another section, which is perhaps my favorite of the book, King discusses and compares his novel Carrie with the film adaptation by director Brian De Palma. First of all, after reading this section, I was kicking myself for not reading Dance Macabre prior to making my video about the original film adaptation of Carrie and how it compares to the novel. Uh, but King indulges us in what his intentions were when writing Carrie and goes so far as to explore his intended sub subtext his intended subtext within the story. He then compares the themes and more explicit messaging of the film to that of his novel and expresses his admiration and appreciation of De Palma's film. It's a rare instance in which King is not disappointed or appalled by a film adaptation of his early work. And like the section in which he discusses Kubrick, I rather enjoyed seeing him hurl words of praise rather than contempt, contempt or disdain. King and Homophobia. <sighs> Another section that caught my attention, and not for a good reason, was when King discusses what he refers to as social horror films, and how this particular genre tackles or comments on the real-life social and socio-political issues of their era. I have to admit, I wasn't fully focused on the audiobook when I first heard this, and, and rather I was folding laundry and only half listening, but then suddenly I was brought back to full attention. King wrote something that came off as what you might call a real yikes moment. King begins the section by discussing musicians like Little Richard and the Beatles, and how they got the conservative, religious fundamentalist types up in arms with in the case of Little Richard, suggestive dance moves and raucous showmanship, and a great deal more in the case of the Beatles when John Lennon famously stated that they were more popular than Jesus. But it is following these two examples that he states something that sure sounds unenlightened at best. Uh, King states, quote, the radio stations continued to play discs by one group even after two male band members announced they were in love with each other. Elton John proclaimed his ACDC sexual proclivities and continued successful. Yet less than 20 years before, wild man Jerry Lee Lewis was blackballed from AM Airplay when he married his 14-year-old cousin." Unquote. And well, it sure sounds like King was equivocating same-sex partnerships and promiscuity with incestuous pedophilia. He basically says that Jerry Lee Lewis got canceled 20 years before for marrying his child cousin, but now the gays are coming out of the closet with no consequence to their careers, so just look at how far we've come as a society. He states this as if it signifies some forward movement of progressive ideals, but those are, of course, not even remotely the same things. I'm sure I don't need to explain to anyone the differences between marrying your 14-year-old cousin and a consensual same-sex or gender relationship, and I'm not sure if it was normal for someone to draw this false equivalence back in the 70s and 80s, but this was a legitimate record scratch moment for me. 
I re-examined the section numerous times to make sure I wasn't misinterpreting what King was saying, but yeah, it's, it's a bad take. And I'm not going to hand wave it away because it was a different time or whatever. I can't speak on what King's intentions were when he said this or if it was a clumsy comparison that he hadn't worded well, but King is kind of a master of the written word who is known for being thoroughly descriptive, so I have a hard time believing I'm misinterpreting the text. That isn't to say that I think King should be canceled or anything. I mean, I am a raging radical left SJW woke scold and all, but King has very obviously evolved on LGBTQ issues. He has openly expressed support of trans rights as well as He has openly expressed support of trans rights as well as proclaimed that non-binary folks are valid as recently as 2020. In fact, King was involved in a very public Twitter spat regarding this topic with J.K. Rowling, author of the Harry Potter series of novels, which you can read more about by following the link in the description. The Dark Descent When I was looking for more information regarding King and his opinions regarding the LGBTQ community, I came across a collection of essays entitled The Dark Descent, Essays Defining Stephen King's Horrorscape, one of which was entitled The Face of Mr. Flip, Homophobia in the Horror of Stephen King. The essay is written by Douglas Kesey, and it's a well-written, thoroughly researched piece. It was such a compelling, intriguing essay, in fact, that I sought out and purchased a hardcover copy of The Dark Descent so I could read through the other essays. It's no secret to anyone who has read any number of earlier King novels that he has a tendency to employ some homophobic, homophobic slurs and potentially offensive language, as well as to portray some horrible people doing and saying horrible things to and about gay folks. There is a specific scene from It that is discussed and analyzed in detail in the essay. Anyone who has read the book knows what scene I'm referring to. Additionally, elements and sections from other King stories, including Salem's Lot, Graveyard Shift, and a handful of others are touched on and examined. At times, it feels a bit like perhaps there is some over-analyzing going on, but rather than draw or propose any definitive conclusions, Douglas examines things from multiple angles and the various ways the use of homophobic, homoph homophobic language and characters from these stories could be interpreted. Fortunately, Douglas doesn't seem to believe that King himself harbors misgivings or negative views toward the LGBTQ community, and I'm inclined to agree. After all, writing about bigots and homophobes does not mean that the author themselves is a bigot or a homophobe. King writes about vampires and murder clowns and sentient automobiles too, and I'm fairly certain he isn't secretly any of those things. Also, I feel it is short-sighted and naive to assume that everything an author writes is somehow a reflection of their personal beliefs or representative of their subconscious biases. That's the beauty of fiction. An author is free to explore belief systems and mindsets that are perhaps entirely foreign to them. No topic or viewpoint should be discarded because it is considerably controversial, dangerous, or harmful, so long as there isn't glorification or validation of those beliefs. However, I can see how some of King's more homophobic characters and the reprehensible things they do and say could be hard to read for the folks who have lived through and experienced similar treatment in their own lives. As a straight white dude, I can't say that this is something I've had a great deal of first-hand experience with, so I'm willing to admit that these scenes and instances are likely far less traumatic for me than they are for those who find it hitting much closer to their own lived experiences. We can, however, take solace in the fact that in King's stories, the characters who harbor the most hateful, toxic ideologies are those who are most likely to meet with the grisliest of fates. Anyway, I've left a link to Douglas's essay in the description for anyone interested. You should check it out. Final thoughts. 
All right, well, that most certainly was not where I expected this dissection of Dance Macabre to go, but with every King book and story, I find there is the potential to be led in a variety of directions, regardless of what King provides at the surface level. If the history of horror and how it affected King and culture is of interest to you, you should check out the book Dance Macabre. And if theorizing and dissecting King stories is of interest to you, which I assume it must be to some extent because you're watching this video, check out The Dark Descent. Hardcover copies can still be found online, but they're not cheap. Mine set me back about 60 bucks. I'll be back next Saturday with a video about the third Bachman book entitled Roadwork, and new videos will continue to drop on this channel every Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So please smoosh the bell with your meat digits to get notifications. Okay, goodbye. Be sure to click like and subscribe to the channel for my continued analysis of all things Stephen King, pretty pleased with blood and guts on top. My name is Mr. Doyle, and this has been a great undertaking.